International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. I'm, I'm really, really, really excited to be introducing this woman, uh, Taraji. Uh, she is a person of courage and determination. And I just have to tell you that uh, in her art form, for those of you who don't know her, in her art form as an Oscar-nominated actress, as a, a single mother who was raising her child and, and trying to make it in Hollywood, to now a recent author, she tells the story of women in all walks of life. What's so impressive about her is that she brings to her characters, whether they're large or small, um, a backstory that is one of resilience and compassion and strength. And she chooses her characters with the intent to inspire. In fact, her decision to play Catherine in the Oscar-nominated movie Hidden Figures, she will tell you, right, and she's going to come out and tell you in just a minute, but she will tell you that she chose the role because she wanted to show girls that they had the brains for math, numbers, and rocket science, literally rocket science. Right? <laughs> a brilliant mind, she said, a brilliant mind does not have a color or a gender. Her career highlights are too numerous uh, to mention all of them, her accolades, but I want to call out a few standouts that are so important to all of us. Uh, one is that in 2015, NAACP um, awarded her the Image Award for Outstanding Actress in a Feature Film and Entertainment, to Entertainer of the Year. She is the third African American to win a Golden Globe for Best Actress in TV for a series drama. And she is the first African American woman to win a Critics' Choice Television Award for Best Actress in a Drama Series. So personally, having watched her career, I have, to, I have to tell you there have been moments of just sheer awesomeness. And I'm sure if you followed her, you know what I mean. From her beautiful, gorgeous voice, um, which in her breakout film, uh, Hustle and Flow, to her, um, to, you know, to her, her just complete control and presence and command um, as Detective Carter in A Person of Interest, to her fabulously witty self as Cookie Lion in Empire. <laughs> And I have, to tell, I have to tell you that I could completely relate to the swinging bat scene. If you, <laughs> as only an underappreciated, sometimes under, underappreciated woman of color, you get why swinging that bat was just so delicious to watch. <laughs> so, and now, now she's also an author and she has a new memoir, Around the Way Girl. And you're gonna get an opportunity to hear about Taraji own story and it, and it is as resilient, as fearless and determined as many of the characters that she plays. So please welcome Taraji P. Henson onto the stage. Don't make me cry. You know I can cry easy. Wow, it's a lot of power in here, right, ladies? Yeah. It's about time we got to this place in history, right? I mean, it's a feeling we haven't felt. We felt it several times in history, but something about this moment, this time now, that um, puts us on the right side of history. And what I love about inclusion, it doesn't look like anything, does it? It looks like whatever it is, whatever race you come from, whatever country, whatever religious background, it doesn't matter who you sleep with at night, people need to see representations of themselves. That's what gives people hope. That's why I decided to become an artist, an actress. I failed math, by the way. Uh, <laughs> didn't have any heroes to look up to. 46 years and I finally found out about these incredible women who <laughs> helped get men into space, right, right, like, who knew? So 
so I decided to be an actress uh, for maybe not the most obvious reason. Sometimes people get into it because of the glamour and the glitz. Well, I know how important arts is because it saved my life. And when you talk about theater, I grew up uh, being on stage. And on stage is where the unimaginable happened. So I could play Romeo. I mean, I could play Romeo if I wanted to. <laughs> but I could also play Juliet. And I could play all of these characters that the world say, they must look like this. So I kind of raised myself, oddly enough, coming from the hood where people who look like me aren't supposed to make any things of themselves. And as a kid, when you're constantly see that, and that's all you see when you walk outside to go to school, you sometimes believe that. But I did it. I, I never believed it because um, I did see a Debbie Allen. You know, I did see Diane Carroll. I did see, um, you know, you name them, we, we saw them. But then for me as a woman, it wasn't just about women of color. It was even women, Betty Davis I studied. Um, so I wanted to be a part of that pool uh, that will go out and save lives because I'm telling you, art is what saved me from the streets of Washington, D.C. And I grew up in the 80s, thank you. I grew up in the 80s in a time where I came from a broken home, but you know, when crack was dropped off in the hood, I saw families broken apart. Why are you at my door knocking, needing a t-shirt when you have your mother and your father home? Well, you know, they're on drugs now. So I grew up in that. And I just felt like it was my mission as an artist. Like how do, how do you, as a young child, how do you change the course of what you see happening around you? You stop complaining about it and you be a part of the solution, right? I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew I would have a voice. I knew I had to in order to save those coming from behind, coming behind me. I remember um, Mayor, Marion Barry, Mayor Marion Barry say, what you want about him? Yeah, he was hooked up in drugs or caught, you know, this is a disease, you know, drugs. So don't be so quick to judge. But what he did do while he was in office was he had a state, um, an arts program. Every summer, kids had a job. We weren't on the streets gangbanging, we had something to do, and that's where I found the arts. And we performed in the streets, we didn't care, we would put speakers out, we had a play, we had something to say, a poem, and I, I saw people come by, you know, they looked like evil, like they were having a bad day, or, and they would see our little <laughs> bang-up show on the sidewalk and they would lighten up, you know? And just the feeling of being on a stage, like even right now, you guys, I'm important. You can want to hear what I <laughs> have to say. <laughs> I'm doing something right. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you. The, beautif the beautiful thing about inclusion is that What's so important about it is that for the first time in my life, I, I go on Instagram, you know, social media is a big part of society now. And we didn't have that growing up. So, you know, now you can get the message out sooner and you can see your work and how it's affecting so many people. And I remember growing up as a black girl not really having many images that look like me on television, but it was some pretty amazing women kicking ass on Charlie's Angels. <laughs> I tried to do the Fair Fawcett look, you know? <laughs> and for a child who only understand God's love, you know, they haven't been tainted by society, they don't see color, they just see a hero. Then we make it about race, right? But what's so beautiful about this story, Hidden Figures, it's just I starting to see young girls of all races, of all colors, dressing up like Katherine Johnson. And that's when I thought about it. I was like, it has nothing to do with race. It has all to do with how does this person lift me up? How does this person make me feel good about being myself? How does this person or this image make me feel good about being a young girl who's going to grow up one day 
and become a woman. It shouldn't have to do, to do with anything with race. It shouldn't have to deal with race, but at the end of the day, it should be a balance, I think. You choose to look up to your heroes, and I think there should be options because <laughs> as humans, we have options. And when you speak of inclusiveness, when you include all of these people, of all of these different walks of lives, you give hope to so many, to so many that might not even look like you. But that's what this world is about. That's what life is about. God put us all, you think it is just a, a coincidence that we ended up here, all together looking different? That's a part of the plan. <laughs> Right? We're supposed to be here. People make the world go round. We are to inspire each other. God put us here. We better get along. We better figure this out. <laughs> but that's why we were put. We were supposed to look different. That's what hum being a human is about. I don't want to go to a planet where everybody looks the same. Boring. <laughs> that means you're telling the same story. So how are you? changing me? How am I changing? How am I evolving? And then here's the kicker. It's not supposed to be easy. <laughs> it's supposed to be a challenge because that's how we learn. If you never fall, how do you learn to get back up? If you never touch the stove and go, ah, that's hot, how will you ever know? I think that's the beauty of life. I think that's the beautiful gift that God gave us. And I don't, I'm not here to preach and tell you that you need to believe in God, but if I were you, uh, I believe in something a little more higher than humans, I'm just saying. <laughs> but this thing called life can be beautiful. It's all perspective. And I think we're in an interesting time in life where we get to see where all of our efforts and all of the hard works of our ancestors, we've come to this junction, juncture in the road, right? Now we have to make a choice. And what's so beautiful about what, what we're witnessing, you can choose to say, oh my God, it's the end of the world, oh Lord, it's the end. Or you can choose to say, wow, isn't this an interesting place to be in history? Am I gonna be on the right side? or the other side that takes us backwards. And what's so beautiful is that we're seeing that the masses are on the right side of history. Just look at this room. We are the power. We, the people. I'm, it's beautiful to see women being lifted up where we should be, where we should have been in, since the beginning of time. Um, <laughs> But it's just a beautiful thing to see the camaraderie um, of all the women because it's almost like, it's not, I think as, as a society we got lazy because it got so easy. You know, everything was going well. We got us a black president. Things look great, right? We got lazy. And so life has a way of yanking you back into reality. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> and it's great to... Um, to come to events like this, because this is the type of artist I am. Like, this is why I chose to be an artist. I say it over and over again. Art changes lives. Art creates life. Art certainly saved mine. And I am, I hold myself to a very high standard in, in the projects that I choose, because I know somehow, some way, I'm affecting someone's life and hopefully in a good way. So I want to bring this to an end because I could talk all day. They would have the Sandman come and get me. <laughs> but, but, you know, speaking of inclusion, thank you for including me in, in this beautiful event today. I feel the power in the room. <laughs> Women, yes, we are the answer. I've always felt that way. I never compete with my sisters. I never have. My circle of women that I keep around me are very close. My best friend of 30 years, that's how I roll. They keep me grounded. 
um, women, we are the answer, but we are the answer when we come to it together. And it's just beautiful to see, and it's a beautiful to be a part of, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank y'all. <laughs> so, I think you all want to hear more from Taraji Hansen. We're going to have a conversation. Yes. You've had challenges, as many of us have. It's not, it's not a straight road. You don't get there easy all the time. But when you encounter fear, you don't run away. You, you find that courage within and you move forward. I think that's another important message for all of us. How do we find that and do that? How do you do that? The first thing is understanding that life is spiritual warfare. That's what it is. It's the light chasing dark, sun chasing the moon, uh, love, hate, yes, no, negative, positive, that's life. And every day as a human, you have a choice. You wake up and you say, which side am I going to choose to be on today? Because <laughs> it's a battle every day. <laughs> and you either choose fear or you choose faith. Fear and faith cannot exist together. You got to choose one. You can't say, oh, Lord, I believe you're going to bless me today. And I'm going to go out here and I'm going to. I'm a work and a blessing is going to come. You can't say that but stay stuck in your so on your sofa in fear because the job is not going to come to you. The blessing is not going to knock on the door. You have to choose a side and you have to walk that path when you leave your house. So I just choose every day. I, some days it's harder than others. <laughs> but I just constantly choose faith. And whatever scares me, faith will clear out the fear because it can't coexist. Awesome. I, I think many of us are, are people of faith, and I think that we don't necessarily always discuss it, but faith obviously has had a huge role in where you are today. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit more? You know, like <laughs> you, my father told me, all you have to have is the faith of a mustard seed. Have you ever seen the size of a mustard it's seed? It's tiny, it's tiny. That's what I went to L.A. with. I didn't know how my life was going to pan out. I had a son. I mean, all the odds were stacked against me, but I had the faith of a mustard seed. And I also had a Howard um, University training. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a blessing. Well, yeah, well, that's the thing. That, that the talent sustains you, but it doesn't necessarily get you in the door. No one cares about how many plays you did on, theater, uh, on a stage in Hollywood. They don't care. Can you get the audience to buy a ticket? And that takes time. But what I did know was if God, you give me the time, I have the talent. Just give me the time. I'll make it, you know. And, and you know, never compare yourself to people's journeys. Their journey is their journey and yours is yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have to train yourself to just stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. And patience and faith. Patience. <laughs> faith, faith, faith. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, a little gift of God. The, the script for Hidden Figures mm -hmm. shows up on your doorstep with a story in it that I don't know if you knew, but I'm going to say most of us did not learn that story in our history class. Yeah. How is that possible? So how was it for you to bring that story to life that is so important to women, so important to African-American women, so important to people of color, so important to this country to set the record straight? They're your passion. That's why I did it. I got the script, and I just remember feeling robbed of, of, yeah. of a dream. No one ever said to me, Taraji, you cannot, you can never do math and science because it's for boys. There was just an understanding. No one was ever bold enough to tell me that, but <laughs> there, it was just an understanding. And so when it was time to pick my desk in the math and science classes, I always chose the desk in the back because why am I here? It's for boys. And I get the script and I just, I'm immediately upset. I'm enraged because how many other girls are walking around thinking the same thing? Right. And I said, well, God, you gave it to the right one. <laughs> <laughs> because I made, it, was, it was passion and it was, 
It, everybody who signed on to do the project, it, it had become their mission to make sure that we included this story that had been excluded for whatever reasons, you know. We can say that it was buried on purpose, or we can say, like oftentimes in my career, we celebrate us, the actors. You never see the 9,999 people that help make me look beautiful on that Green. So it's the same thing. We celebrate the astronauts. We don't necessarily <laughs> celebrate all the scientists that help get them into space. So I think there was a little bit of that and what was going on in the time. But guess what? Here we are. Here we and are. We fixed it. <laughs> we we fixed had it. time. Thank you for that. We had time <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> so um, women and African Americans are underrepresented mm -hmm. in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math which is very important in this room. We are in the Bay Area here, home of technology. We're also underrepresented in, in film and television, and, and the Hollywood pay gap comes to mind for me. What do you think's going on there, and what do you think we can do to, to change that? Um, you know, I started off wanting to be just an actress. Didn't really know that I would end up producing. Um, you know, that's, that's what it takes. It takes people that break this glass ceiling down create opportunities for others coming behind them and that's how you uh, you see this diversity um, and that's what you're starting to see I saw I saw somewhere um, that Kerry Washington and Viola Davis are both starting production companies and so it takes that you know every time I go and I talk to these young kids you know they're so infatuated with being an actress they want to be pretty and they want to be in front of the camera and I'm like no 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 you're thinking too small where are the female studio execs where are african-american executives that are gonna change the way we see film so it's all getting a making people think differently you know what I mean so I do the best I can I make the little bit of change that I can and hopefully that affects the next person and so on and so forth but I think Hollywood is in a good place I think we're I think Hollywood is the most progressive when it comes to diversity I think the world looks to Hollywood as an example and I think we're doing really well. You no, know, I think there's tremendous power in film and television Absolutely. to pull the world forward. It's why it's really an incredibly important occupation. I mean incredibly important. That's why it saddens me to see that the government snatching and has been for years arts and music and music out of schools, especially public schools, because that's where it's needed. Yes, that's what engages the child's time, mind. It does. And it's, you have to come up with different ways to entertain and educate these children today because now we're battling the internet. Yeah. Now a kid can zone out real easy in class on the phone. Right. You know, so we have to make it interesting, and I think that's where the arts play such a big role. Oh, I'm, I am a huge advocate for the arts as well, so yes. um, thank you for speaking to that. So you and I have one thing in common. We're both single moms. Yes. Um, and uh, often we hear that women can't have it all, but you, I believe, had your son, Marcel, when you were still in college. You went off to Hollywood with hardly any change in your pocket, um, and yet here we are sitting on this, on this dais today, and you know, we have a lot, we have a lot. So what's your advice for women in the audience around balancing career, ambition, motherhood, family, faith? How do you do it? How do you bring those together? I just, I, I ignore naysayers because when you're doing something different or something that no one has ever done before, you look like a unicorn. So, ah, oh, what are you doing? You'll never make it. Ah, you're going to die. You're going to starve. And it's like, <laughs> I haven't even tried yet. <laughs> I've just got warmed up here. I, mean, fine, let me, I just had the baby. Can I at least try to finish college first? You know, so I think when you do things that society deems is not the right way. But first of all, what is the right way? Oh, I don't know. I've never known. Right. <laughs> the right way is your way. Yeah. <laughs> you create your own standards. Well, miss, I know you got married and, and you have the picket fence. Well, life just didn't deal me those cards. I have these cards, so this is what I'm going to do with them. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm a horrible person or <laughs> that I'm going to fail in life because I became a mother early. It it's just means I'm a mother now. Moving on. I mean, I think sometimes, and a lot of times when people, it's not out of hate, it's out of fear, it's out of their own fear. But what you're not going to do is project your fear onto me. Your fear has, is none of my business. 
It's not. And I was with my son's father. He was my boyfriend. It wasn't like I was out there being loosey goosey and it was an oops. <laughs> well, it was an oops because we didn't plan it. But <laughs> it was okay. It was just my journey. And, and I, you know, some people looked at her, oh, she's a single mother. She's going to drop out of college. I love to hear those whispers. Please underestimate me. <laughs> I'm begging you. <laughs> because I will sit back and watch you eat crow. Um, <laughs> But no, and it's just about having that fight. You see that fight I have? If you don't have that fight for yourself, no one else. I tell my son this all the time. Baby, I can't want it more than you. Right. I can't. I can give you the road map. I can tell you the people to go and see. But if you don't have that will inside, that passion inside of you, it's moot. So you have to have that. And you can't let people dictate and project. I'm sorry, I don't. So you all, you, you heard it here, we're out of time, but you're, you get a certain hand of cards and <laughs> you who decides how to play them. Choice driven. And don't, don't let other people's fears yeah, rule you. Thank I think you. it was yes. one other Im quest important question Which on it. One? You were saying something about how white women and black oh. women, how we can come together. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I didn't know about that. Time, was very I'm important. Okay. I have to address that before okay. we leave. Just so you know. Wait, do you want me to ask the question? Yes, yeah, I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> so, so uh, speaking the truth here, in the film Hidden Figures, white women did not show support for or include their black sisters. Do you think that dynamic has changed since the 60s? The beautiful thing about this film, three important white women made it happen. Um, Donna Gelati got the 54 book page proposal, wasn't even a full book yet, sent it to Elizabeth Gabler, studio exec over at Fox. She got it to Stacey Snyder, the president, and here's this film. We need each other, and we gotta get along. <laughs> we need each other. We need each other. Enjoy the rest of your day. Roger T. Hansen. Thank you. Roger T. Hansen. Our next guest, who is not only a stunning, passionate, engaging actress, but also a true activist in that she pushes for what she believes in, and she does want to help her community and better the lives of others who may not be so fortunate. And she is going to share her wealth of experience and her passion and energy with us. So let me tell you a little bit about this not so mysterious, amazing guest. She's certainly one of Hollywood's most sought after leading lady with film credits including The 25th Hour, Men in Black 2, He's Got Game, The Rundown, and more. I know you know who I'm talking about, but I'm building it up anyway. She's worked with some of Hollywood's leading um, directors, actors, including Quentin Tarantino, Robert De Niro, I'm skipping straight to the part that says but more importantly to Rosario is her advocacy work. She co-founded Voto Latino in 2004 and lends her time to various other organizations including V-Day, the Lower East Side Girls Club, and the Environmental Media Association. And I know she wants me to get right to it, but she was recently awarded the President's Volunteer Service Award. That's huge for her contributions to the community. Please welcome once again to the stage, Rosario Dawson. <laughs> Which is what you like? I don't care. I, I was saying because of these, I just feel like control. I just want to be like, right? Nah, 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 grown up. She was seriously doing that backstage the entire time, and I was trying to copy to no success. Um, Rosario, it is truly a pleasure to be meeting you and chatting with you. And I know everyone here, they've seen you on film, they've seen you on the screen, but what they don't know, possibly, is your childhood, how you grew up, and how that shaped you to be the amazing person that you are today. So let's start from the beginning, all right? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm so grateful to be here, especially at a conference that has dance breaks in between. Yes. I was like, Agreed. why is that not a staple of every event? This is awesome. It's the early morning, too, so it's like... Yes. Um, uh, I mean, 
to start at the beginning. I, I met your mom back on Avenue right? X. Exactly. Yeah. I was conceived on Avenue X. Um, <laughs> I can get into more details, but I'll save you guys. Um, but uh, Brooklyn in the house. Oh, yes. Oh. And uh, I was raised by a very fierce family. You know, I have a very um, interesting, diverse background of being Afro-Cubana and Puerto Rican and Irish and Native American. Um, so you're totally so, American. You're yes, a little bit of everything. Absolutely, a little bit of everything. And every, everyone in my family, every single yeah. time they can, there's like, wait, we don't have any Italian. Yeah. And when you get married, we we'll have some babies. No, but you, <laughs> grew up, you grew up fighting in terms of your childhood. No, yeah, so we, um, you know, struggle. There was a lot of struggle and it goes back many generations. My great grandmother was part of the ladies, Inter um, she was a, a member of the ladies international garment workers union. And my grandmother used to work with her and, and union rights and labor rights. And my grandmother would translate different materials and flyers and things to make sure that the community could all be involved. And she used to make sure that my mom was there and a part of that. And then that passed on to me. And there's my mom right here. Hi and mom. <laughs> but she took you to protests and marches and, mm -hmm. and things like that growing up. One of the very ones we talk about right here in San Francisco, we used to live here. I, I went to John Muir Elementary School. I used to live right there on Webster Street. Um, and, you know, that was, that was my first protest that I ever went to. And we were bombs pushing us around in carts and we're making all these posters to save trees. <laughs> lots and lots of posters. Mm -hmm. Heart was in the right place. Um, but, you know, you, you got to put yourself out there and you yeah. learn and then you keep going. And that's been my big lesson in life, you know, and the tenacity of my family. You know, my mom was, uh, we moved into a squat when I was a young girl. I was like five, six years old and we moved into an abandoned building that didn't have water, heat or electricity. But my mom knew that the railroad apartment that was in squalor with the slumlord that we had was worse than that and that this was an opportunity. And I just, to have that kind of tenacity, to have that kind of forethought, um, to have that kind of vision, is just something that's really always made me look at things that could be looked at as just tragedies and upsets, or like, you know, we were very poor and we didn't have very much. And you can look at it that way. Or you can go, oh my God, thank God my parents did that, because on the stoop that they ended up building to protect me from the drug dealers in the neighborhood, I got discovered and became an actor, and my whole life changed because of it. And we didn't have the finances to grow up in the Lower East Side otherwise I would have been in deep someplace else and you wouldn't I wouldn't be here talking to any of you and so I'm just so grateful of all the highs and lows and in-betweens because all of it is what brings us here today and we have to be always very proud of our journey so first of all so I want to say like you're like everyone knows you here for movies I'm trying to be the Sam Jackson of female actresses <laughs> so I'm trying to do as many moves as possible to actually make that true but I'm not necessarily saying, yeah, I've seen it, but I'll, at some point, at some point. So let me ask you now, you grew up always comfortable speaking your views, yeah. but when you got into acting, was there ever the fear that if you did, perhaps you would be blacklisted and that maybe you shouldn't be so vocal? Did that ever cross your mind? Um, no. I mean, I've been this <laughs> most of my life. We thought that would um, be the answer. <laughs> yeah, but I, I definitely noticed the difference. I also, I, I specifically, you know, I, I, uh, I was a co I'm a co-founder of a voting organization called Vota Latino. And we've been mobilizing for it's a dozen years now. And we're constantly calling up people going, hey, do you want to be in a PSA? You know, we, Jennifer Lopez's very first PSA was with us, Cameron Diaz. We got all the different people over the years. My mom was the person to be like, yo. Come on, yeah. it's your community, let's yeah. do this, you know? But it was really hard. And now I look at the award ceremonies and everyone is using it as an opportunity to talk about mental health issues or diversity issues or um, equality issues. And it's remarkable. You know, there was one upon a time when Marlon Brando had a Native American go up and say something and it was like, this is the wrong place to do that. Mm -hmm. And now it's like every opportunity we can, we're trying to reach out to each other and connect. And that's just so powerful and beautiful and to have been along that journey. I never begrudge anyone for not starting earlier. I, got, I started early because my mom took me when I was a child. But sometimes people don't start giving back in the way that we traditionally think until their 40s or 50s when maybe their child gets sick and that's okay. or their neighbor gets hurt and then they're compelled. And that's okay. Wherever along the journey, if you're taking care of yourself, mask on first before you can help anybody. I never begrudge anyone taking care of themselves. That's the most vital thing that we can do to make sure we, we actually have, we assure mutual construction mm -hmm. and creativity. 
You were talking about public figures having sort of a platform, a megaphone, to speak up for what they believe in, and, and you certainly use yours, but what about the ladies here? What if they don't have um, that public figure status? How can they still get their message out and participate and push for the things that they believe in? Well, for me, it's, you know, I was really trying to figure out like what I wanted to talk about here, and you know this this year has been an insane and incredible journey for a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Um, and for me, one of the things that was really intense last year was that I almost died. I had um, a ruptured cyst, and they had to take a liter of blood out of my abdomen, and. Um, and it was just amazing, you know, it took, it took that and having to go to the emergency room in order for me to stop working. It's the first time in 22 years that I ever did, had to take time off of work. And it's like, I'm not taking care of myself. I can't do everything, you know, and it's actually okay to, to, to have self-care and ask for help. I have a, a fashion line in Ghana and we use a, um, an adinkra symbol a lot in our Is designs. that what you're wearing? No, actually this is a different designer that we carry. Um, Max Hosa, he does um, knits and things uh, based off of his tribe in South Africa. Um, but we, are, we carry a lot of different brands and, um, and we make clothes. We work with the UN Ethical Fashion Initiative. We built a factory in Ghana and it's been really, really remarkable. Okay, isn't that fabulous, but, everyone? <laughs> How can we find... Go to Studio 189, it's amazing. Studio but one of the okay. things I keep learning all the time, when you go there, people die and they go, oh, they just died. Yeah. Or, you know, there's just a, such a different, there's just such a presentness of the moment because it's just, you don't have any guarantee of tomorrow. They don't have a lot of the resources. If something breaks, you have, they have to fix it. Yeah. There's no store to go to. It's, there's a different kind of self-reliance. And you watch and the people we're working with, and like, oh, we have a better batiker. And it's like, but then why don't you train our batiker? Why do you need to invest in each other? And so one of the symbols that we use a lot in our designs is an adinkra symbol that says, boa mene me moa wo, which is help me. Asking for that help for, help me and let me help you and really transforming the conversation around working together and not just this it's partnership mm -hmm. and um and i've just recognized that I, I i'm doing so much i'm constantly out there talking about how can we can be out there in the world and doing great things and the best way to do that is going how, how is your relationship to yourself and your health and your body if you want peace out there are you peaceful are you meditating? Are you taking time in the morning before you just jump on your phone? You know, how, I, I want to fix my community. When's the last time you had a really great heart to heart with your mom, or your daughter, or your husband, or your neighbor? You know, how are you really making that connection? We, we, we put so much, I felt like I was putting so much out there and my insides were crumbling. And I realized I had to do something about that and recognize that I'm, I can't do it all by myself. And how grateful that, that, how empowering actually that was, because I had such a remarkable community that was like, we're so happy that you asked, you know, this is what I can offer. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I just say to all of you, you know, embrace your vulnerabilities, embrace I don't know, and reach out to each other and make sure that, you know, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite personally for me. I don't want to be saying something and doing something else. I really want to be in alignment and integrity and authenticity and constantly present myself as authentically as possible. And the only way to do that is to really prioritize myself, my friends, my family, my community, really. Not just where you're not angry at each other. That's not enough. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, we're not mad at each other, yeah. so it's fine, I'm gonna put my energy over here. F fix that and watch the world change. If everyone took on their families and their friends and their communities like that, everything would transform. And I can see how important family is to you in centering yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it's so easy in our busy lives to sometimes forget that, to reach out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you encounter that as with your work. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I met this really amazing woman a couple of days ago. She was Miss America. She was in a wheelchair for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Her name is Tracy Broughton. And she started this um, company called uh, Couture Crutches. And what she would, she was for 11 years, she couldn't even speak. She had to do all this physical therapy and she had to do all this, she did experimental stuff. And now she's on this crutch and it's bedazzled. It's fantastic. Wow. And so you're automatically drawn to her. And what I was so interested by is just that there's so much that we're not, that is not visible to us. People's pains, people's problems, people's issues, humanity. We're really not, we talk about it, but we're not really visible to it. How many times have you, you know, on your way to a charity, stepped over a homeless person that you didn't even want to look at yeah. because you were embarrassed that, you know, you cried, not even because you're a bad person or like whatever, you would have given money, but you only have credit cards now. No one ever carries, no one ever has cash. <laughs> so you're just like embarrassed. So you just don't even look at the person. You don't smile at them. You don't engage with them. You don't see them 
and they can feel that not being seen. Mm. And I, what I thought was so beautiful, and she was saying what was so transformative about it, wasn't just about the self-esteem of the kids and the people that she works with that she's giving these awesome crutches with and it's bedazzled and like spikes and like it's badass looking. <laughs> but it also creates conversation and creates visibility because mm. now this thing, disability, that we don't want to ever really kind of talk about or deal with or it feels embarrassing like to be vulnerable, to need in some way, is something that we have to see and we have to break through and we have to talk about. And I just am so grateful for people who see those like moments and go, this is an opportunity here, not just for myself and my own story, but this is a way of going, I saw what this did for other people who are not disabled. The fact that they got to see a disabled person who was able and proud and had self-esteem and that transformed their relationship with disability and maybe that person who doesn't maybe necessarily know any other disabled people maybe they'll be an advocate for people like me mm -hmm. and that's how we have to start going where other people are asking those questions going that's not I'm not just like skipping it not ignoring it because I don't know or it seems uncomfortable but going I don't know about that how can I talk about that more how can I empower you because I want you to do the same for me. You know, I want you to care about the stuff that I care about. That's so right. let's, let's be in communication with that. Let's create a dialogue. It's one of the reasons why I really liked doing this like this. You know, and we've been talking backstage, so I know I've talked it's more up here. It's just a conversation. It's like a talk friends. It's thousands of friends. It's yeah. too wild. You know, it's like it's not just a monologue. And yeah. we need to be, my mom says, two ears, one mouth. You know, you got to do a lot of listening. So I want to ask you, Let's talk a little. I'm not turning right now. I'm let's, sorry. I mean, I heard that. Oh, no, no, it's all good. Let's talk about diversity in Hollywood. You talk about visibility and how yeah. important it is to see the people who may not be seen and give them a voice. That's um, very important to you. When you came into Hollywood, did you feel that it was difficult to be at the table, not just in terms of being on screen, but really having the power, um, having a seat at the table when decisions are made as to how perhaps women are represented, minorities are represented. And has there been an evolving in that regard? And, and do you feel like you've made a difference there? Um, yeah, but it's, it's all the women even who came before us and had to try to fit themselves into the patriarchal structure and gave us that visibility that it was possible to be there. And then now we can transform it. You know, it's, there's, there's so many people in, that had to struggle so hard to get to the top. And now younger people necessarily don't appreciate that. Because yeah. they're like, why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. Right. But that, that evolution wouldn't have been possible without those people making those sacrifices. Yes. And now you have young people who are going, I don't want to wear makeup. Why are you trying so hard? Yes. You know, and it's pretty remarkable, you know, this kind of pushback. That's just, it's a natural thing that kind of comes out of evolution if we keep, but you can't evolve if you're not in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to put yourself out there. You're not going to necessarily get it right. You know, there's so many times where I hesitate because I'm like, oh, I don't know that I know the right thing to say or do. But most of the things that I've learned from, from are from my great grandma, my mom, my dad, my brother. And they're, it's a lot of times it's their mistakes. You know, it's the fact that but they put themselves out there and watching how they dealt with that mistake. Did they let it break them or did they come out of it stronger and better and smarter? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the point. You know, like last year was tough. I was a Bernie Sanders surrogate. That didn't turn out the way I thought. Um, but something great came out of it. Yeah, I was, a, yes. I, but I was a standing rock, you know, I was really pushing for standing rock. I got to run with the runners when they first came up from DC yep. to New York. And we're, you know, it's, it's, and now you have a lot of kids who are committing suicide daily because they feel like it was all for naught. Yeah. And it's devastating. Um, but it's so, so much of life, you know, you might not be able to see this moment right now and like what the exact thing to do is, but you have to keep trying because so much of life is like, you know, we don't, we want to look good. And so we want to unravel or take out the little nicks and things in our sweaters or whatever, like our life fabric that we don't like and just, oh, that, that doesn't look good. That's right. But you start unraveling it and it all falls apart. No, of course. And like, had, you know, I wish I could have said things differently, not been so reactionary, not be so angry. Like, I wish I could do all these different things. But had I changed any one thing, mm -hmm. I might not have met my boyfriend at the DNC. I would not have been at that very moment with the man that I love right Yay! now. You know, I, I wouldn't have met those amazing right. runners and the right. people that we're working with and we're still trying to figure yeah. out how we can help so not only Standing Rock Tribe, but others. Yeah. You know, it's like, you just got to throw yourself in there and go, you know what? I didn't do that perfectly. How can I do that better next time? Because my heart and my intention is in the right place and I want to be effective. So communicate that to me. If you see me, share and I'll always share with you. So given today's <laughs> political climate, yeah and the division that sometimes we see out there among different mm -hmm. groups of people. How do you see that affecting your next 
um, steps in terms of your activism? Where do you see yourself going to try um, to lend a positive force to the direction of things? That's what, for me, it's just really trying to communicate to people how important it is to take care of yourself. You know, Eve Ensler ended up having, you know, she's got a scar down her body and almost died. And she ended up having to get the exact same surgery that she was helping women get in the Congo who had been raped and re-raped. And we internalize a lot. We, sep we, we suppress a lot. And it's, our bodies are f phenomenal things. And they will protect us. And they will, don't, don't, don't look at that thing, that's painful. Don't look at that, your knee's really bad. No. You know, and like we have to start looking at the stuff that's not working for us. And when we have pain, we got to really deal with it and support each other and recognize we, we can't just internalize everything. We can't try to look good all the time. We can't be perfect all the time. And we just have that in this limelight. That's this, all the Snapchat filters, everything is always trying to make everything perfect. And that doesn't work. We're not perfect. And that's actually wonderful because perfection is death. And I'm very grateful to be alive. Could not agree more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosario Dawson, fabulous. Thank you so much. We look to you for guidance.